Tiffany McDaniel's previous novel, Betty, made such a huge impact with booksellers and readers that we were delighted to make it the fiction book of the month back in August 2021. It was a brutal read at times, but violence and poverty were combined with an attention to language that made it a must read for many. Her new novel, On the Savage Side, deals in similarly dark terrain. So I sat down with Tiffany to talk about the real unsolved crime that inspired it, writing about the most difficult things and finding hope in the darkness. Tiffany, it's a real pleasure to speak to you about uh, On the Savage Side. I I want to start with the characters because I think this is one of the most immediate charms of this novel um, are the characters of Ark, Daffy and Mamor Milkweed. Um, they feel to me as though they've come from something very real. And so I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how you created those characters. Can we begin with Mamor Milkweed because she really is something else? Yeah, when I was uh, writing the characters for this book, um, you know, I had grown up in communities that had been impacted by drugs and I had played with kids like Ark and Daffy. And so when I was heading into this story, I knew that I really wanted to uh, discover these characters who are the two twin sisters, the main twin sister characters and discover who they were in their childhood and so that readers can understand the full arc of their story. And it's a story that deals with some heavy stuff. And Mamma Milkweed is really the shining light in their lives. She's really the lighthouse for when these storms come. And so I wanted their relationship to really feel like that warm hug that Mamma is for these two girls in the story. There's something about the way that Mamma Milkweed speaks. There's this sort of a lot of idiomatic phrases and sort of folkloric. Uh, sayings and I felt as though you had heard these things from somebody real I'm not saying that you had a mum or milkweed but am I right in thinking that these are sort of it felt it really rooted me in in the place and the time um where did that sort of that way of her speaking come from well I think um you know southern Ohio is really rich with myth and legend and you know I was fortunate enough to grow up in that um surroundings and especially uh, you know, being raised in the Cherokee culture of my mother, Betty, who shared a lot of these uh, legends and stories with me, who they were stories passed down to her from um, her father, Landon. And so, you know, I've always been this cocoon of rich myth and legend and story. And I think oftentimes that does bleed over into, um, you know, my characters within the book. And I really wanted Mamma Milkweed to have, uh, you know, a lot of that rich texture because she is telling these girls about their history of being witches. And she's really um, trying to craft their understanding of their own power, which she uses through those stories of lineage and myth. And so that was something I really wanted to infuse her character with. Um, and with the characters of Ark and Daffy, as you said, they're, they're twin sisters. And this might seem like a slightly ridiculous question, but when you're crafting characters, is there ever that thing where you have to was it hard, I suppose, to, to make sure that they felt like two very sort of delineated different characters without losing their twinness, if you see what I mean? Is there an extra challenge there? I think uh, because with my writing, you know, I tend to write sibling characters quite often. I'm trying to think about the novels I have and um, I have over 20 written and in many of them, the, the main characters are siblings to some degree. Mm. I'm one of three sisters. And so I think it's just a natural uh, way for me to explore that relationship even more. But I think having had that experience myself in my life and then writing these characters in the book, um, it's kind of, I don't want to say routine now, but just something yeah. that I'm kind of familiar enough with where it, it doesn't pose that extra challenge. Yeah. There is a, a sort of a true story or a sort of true inspiration behind this novel. Um, would you mind telling listeners a little bit about that sort of that that spark for the novel? Yeah. So it's inspired by a true crime case of Chillicothe, Ohio, known as the Chillicothe Six. And um, it was named for the original six victims, though the victim count, uh, you know, has far exceeded that original number. Um, and it was a few years ago, women had started to go missing. Some of their bodies were discovered. Some are still missing today. And it's still a crime that is still unsolved to this day. 
obviously one option would have been to to write a novel that was very much based on that case but you've chosen to sort of relocate it to a slightly different time period was that simply to give it some distance from the real case or was there something about wanting to to move it a few years back into the past so i don't tend to write a lot of technology into my books i'm not a lover of technology any chance i get to escape from the computer i take it i just don't like you know, being in front of it. And with my characters, I try to avoid um, dates in which technology and gadgets will be in their lives. In this case, I really didn't want that option because social media and cell phones would have changed the direction of the story. These women being missing, they could just, you know, use their cell phone, they could log into social media, it would completely change the way that they're interacting with each other. Mm. And I really wanted to keep their relationship more grounded, more organic. And for me, at least in my writing, technology is a character that will dictate um, certain decision making that they'll, you know, come to within the story itself. So I try to avoid that. It's so funny, isn't it? There, I know so many authors who <clears throat> try to find ways of, of, as you say, removing the technology because it makes plotting so difficult. Because as you say, it would be so easy nowadays for somebody to pick up a phone and find out something or locate somebody. Whereas just the simple thing of, I walked past an old phone box the other day and it was completely gutted. It didn't work anymore. And I was like, yes, you had to make a journey to make a phone call back in the day. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> as you mentioned, the, the, the novel does take the reader into some fairly dark places and I wanted to ask about writing some of those dark things the first of those I suppose is addiction um you you mentioned that you had grown up um and had you know sort of experience of of that addiction it's a it's it's I think a really hard thing to get right so could you tell me a little bit about writing what addiction feels like and the effects that it has Yeah. So um, like I said, I'd grown up in uh, South Central and Southern Ohio, not only in communities impacted by drugs, but, um, you know, I knew women like these women in my own family, you know, women whose paths took them to addiction. Uh, My aunt Spray and Flossie, who I wrote extensively about and Betty uh, struggled with addiction in their own lives. So from a very early age, I understood um, addiction, especially generational addiction. I remember mm. my mother, Betty, telling me, you know, you don't want to drink or smoke because addiction is in your genes. And I was a real small kid at the time. I was wearing a pair of Levi's. And so I started to kind of search my pockets for what she was talking about. So from a very early age, I understood what the face of addiction looked like. And so for me, it was just, uh, you know, kind of flipping back through those experiences and, um, you know, hoping to capture these characters in that authentic way that readers who also have experience with addiction, whether personally or through members of their own family, would identify and understand. I suppose, is there an element of of wanting to elicit sympathy in the reader to sort of try and understand what addiction really is and and why it can be a problematic to sort of to blame the addict, if you like, or or is it more sort of empathy rather than sympathy? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to give the reader any sort of direction of how they should feel about it, because some readers uh, will feel one way, other readers will feel another, you know, some readers might even be victims of crime as the result of a perpetrator, um, mm. you know, who is also addicted. And so I never wanted to go over that line and say, oh, that, you know, they're absolved of responsibility, they have no guilt. Um, I think that's important to emphasize that, you know, these individuals um, in the book are who they are. And that's the story that I'm presenting. And I'm not presenting the story of anyone else. And so readers, you know, based on their own experiences can draw their own conclusions. But my goal with this story was just to present these women who they are, kind of how um, their early experiences led them um, to this path in life and really not try to uh, define or capture addiction as a whole or what that means spread out across all these countless situations that are kind of applied in in real life. One of the other uh, sort of uh, tricky things I suppose to write about uh, is violence, um, particularly violence against women and and the sexual assault of women um this must be a very tough read i think for women and for me as well um and i wonder whether it's hard 
for the writer to to go to those places. Um, tell me a bit about writing that sort of side of the book. I tend to write about feminist themes throughout the course of my work. And um, I probably, you know, I wouldn't say I tackled heavier topics in, in Betty, but it was similar topics. And so mm. it was kind of already in the tool chest uh, for this book. And so um, I guess I just have never been afraid to kind of talk about these things because I think it's important to get it out there in the open. And I think, you know, being female myself is just kind of part of the territory. So it's not anything that kind of, um, you know, I don't want to face. It was really just going back into that tool chest and seeing what aspect of that violence that I could incorporate into this book that was meaningful to these women and meaningful to what they had experienced. These dark topics that we're talking about um, obviously have, you know, traumatic effects on the characters. And that sort of leads us to the title, which was one of my favorite things about this book. Um, there's that thing that happens when um, a, a title appears in the text, and sometimes it's the perfect sort of crystallization of what the book is about, and sometimes it can feel really odd. But with this book, I was like, oh, that's just fantastic. Could you tell us a little bit about what the savage side means? And then we can talk a little bit more about the significance. Right, yeah. So um, the savage side draws into the relationship with Mama Milkweed, Ark, and Daffy. And, um, you know, Mama Milkweed crochets and she teaches Ark and Daffy to crochet. And, you know, as they're crocheting this afghan, Mama Milkweed is explaining to the girls that, you know, just like with this afghan, there's a beautiful side and a savage side in life. And for anyone who's crocheted, you know that you have a lot of yarn ends that you have to work in back into your project and they'll kind of hang out the other side of your work. And so as Mama Milkweed is explaining this to Ark and Daffy, she's saying, see these yarn strings, that's kind of the savage side of life. And I won't go into much more detail to spoil that for readers, but that's kind of the um, basis of what she's trying to tell them, that there is a beautiful side to life. There's a savage side to life and you have to be prepared to face it. And that's exactly what she's trying to prepare these girls for. It's a fantastic image uh, and metaphor, you know, for, for what Ark and Daffy are going through. Um, and I guess it raises the question towards the end of the book for, for me as a reader, which was that with all of the darkness that you read um, and the, the the light and the joy, um, there's the question of, of whether there's hope at the end of that story. Um, I guess, you know, whether the beautiful side or the savage side is the one that ends face up at the end of the novel. How did you feel as a writer about instilling hope or, or how you wanted to tell that story and, and leave it on the final page? Well, um, because the subject matter I, I tend to write about is a bit heavier, I do like to balance that um, to where we have those moments of joy and hope and light within the book. And I think, you know, that's important, especially in a story like this, where we're talking about violence and crime, for there to be that balance of light and dark, because I didn't want to create a book that was completely... Um, you know, void of that light. I didn't want readers to turn away from it. I really wanted them to embrace this story, hopefully embracing the real story of the real women in real life. You know, these characters in the book are fiction, but my hope is to kind of bring light to that case. And so I really wanted to make sure that balance of hope and light was there within the story. It's really interesting about, as you mentioned, because of it being based on a real case um the Chillicothe six and then it reminded me very much therefore of a, another book I read called the five by Hallie Rubenhold which is a book which looks at the real lives of the five primary victims of Jack the Ripper and I think that she was driven by sort of similar feminist ideals which was that she wanted to know more about the real lives of these women and be able to focus on them rather than on the killer um and it was amazing the amount of flack that she got for writing that book because, of course, I suppose the Ripperologists get you know the bit between their teeth and they worry about the truth and what we can prove and not prove and all the rest of it. But it was very important for her to be able to sort of show how these women had ended up where they ended up. Would you say that you were sort of driven by a, a similar motivation to sort of show how women might find themselves in that position? Right, yeah. I kind of wanted to capture, you know, the spirit of who these women might have been I didn't want to tread on their truth. You know, I think their story has yet to be told. It should be told by their family, 
by the friends who knew them best. And so my hope with writing these characters was just to capture the spirit of who they might have been, show that these women, because I remember when the crime first started, there was some sentiment in the community that because the women were linked to addiction and kind of the lifestyle associated with it, that Mm. they were somehow active participants in their murder. And so I really wanted to present them as the mothers, sisters, and daughters that they were, that their lives had value and that they did matter. And just to finish off, um, I suppose there's rather a cliche thing to say that locations can be like a character in the novel, but it felt to me that the river uh, that runs through this book um, was terribly important. Could you tell me a little bit about maybe the real river that it's based on and, and why it feels so important in the book? Yeah, so um, in real life, the women were found in the river or near the river. And so I really wanted the importance of their final moments to be uh, captured in the river. And I really wanted to also hear the river speaking. And so in parts of the book, you'll hear the narrative from the river talking about what it's like um, to receive these bodies in her water. And I've always grown up by rivers and the water's always been very important to me. And so when I was researching the book, going back to Chillicothe, um, you know, visiting those sites of where the women's bodies were discovered, where some of them were last seen, um, I had taken the photo of the river that appears in the book while standing on the overpass where um, Shasta Hemmerich was last seen alive. And so the river, very important part of the story, was very important for these women's final moments. And I really wanted to ensure that that was amplified within the story. Fantastic. Tiffany, it's so great to hear you telling us a little bit more about what's gone into the writing of this book. Um, So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. On the Savage Side is out now. And for a limited time, you can find signed copies on waterstones.com.